presentation of To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU is made possible in part by support from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. And from the members of WPSU. From the studios of Penn State Public Broadcasting, this is to the best of my knowledge. Good evening, I'm Graham Spanier. Tonight we'll talk about the changing transition from adolescence to adulthood. Today's young people are taking longer to leave home, achieve financial independence and start families. A new period of life is emerging where our children may no longer be adolescents, but are not yet independent adults. Are today's youth avoiding the responsibilities of adulthood or have changes in the world altered the path to early adult life? Tonight we'll discuss the changing transition to adulthood. You can join the conversation. Call us at 1-800-543-8242. You can also email your questions to response at psu.edu. And now let's meet our guests. Wayne Osgood is a professor in Penn State's Department of Sociology and Crime, Law, and Justice. He is part of the MacArthur Foundation's network on the transitions to adulthood, which examines the changing nature of early adulthood and the policies, programs, and institutions that support the development of young adults. Karen Fingerman is the Berner Hanley Professor in Gerontology, Developmental and Family Studies at Purdue University. She was also a professor at Penn State's annual symposium on family issues. Thank you both for being here. It's great Thank to be you. here. Thanks for having us. Well, let's begin with this topic that some people are talking about of whether there is a, actually a new developmental stage that's emerged somewhere between adolescence and adulthood, or whether what's happening with this extended period is really just an extension of the transition that we've always known? Um, I think there's, there are definitely some new things that are going on for young people. And so um, one of the things that we've been looking at is how things were in 1980 versus how they are today in 2010. And there's definitely some changes in terms of People ages 18 to 24 are in touch with their parents a lot more. They're getting a lot more help from their parents. By the same token, they're not adolescents anymore. There's not as much conflict with the parents. The parents aren't um, monitoring them as closely. Their goals are very different. So whereas in adolescence, everyone was in high school or junior high, you know, and through into high school, people are doing very, very diverse things and getting instigated into the future. So certainly the period of life from 18 to 24 is looking different right now mm -hmm. than it did 30 years ago, 50 years ago, and you know, farther back. And Dr. Osgood, what's your view of this idea of a new stage in there somewhere? Well, uh, I'm a sociologist and, and the idea of stages is sort of an idea of developmental psychologists. Um, but they tend to want to reserve the term for something that's pretty universal that people everywhere, it's part of life. And it, as a period where there's something about the person that develops um, in a different way than any other time. And I think the changes that we see are really important. And life is, as Karen was saying now, pretty different than it was uh, a few decades back. But uh, probably uh, calling it a stage is uh, mm -hmm. perhaps the wrong term. Now, some of what's happening out there today is undoubtedly related to the economy. We should talk about that a little bit. But in addition, we know the average age at first marriage is increasing. It's, it's getting later. People are waiting longer to have children. And there does seem to be a little more contact with families, including moving back in, in with your families after high school or college and sticking around for a while. So how much of this is the economy? Mm -hmm. uh, versus how much of it is just a change in how people are thinking about their continued connection to their families. Well, let me say a little about the economy part, if that's okay. Um, we're really all thinking a lot about the recession that we're perhaps still in the midst of. And certainly that's 
exacerbated things, making it much harder for teens or young adults to launch and get uh, well-paying full-time jobs that let them take care of themselves. But the economic changes have been going on for a long time. We tend to think of the 1950s as a reference point. Um, and at that time, the transition adulthood was especially fast because the economy was just humming along. And it was a time that even people who just had a high school could, uh, degree could pretty readily land a well-paying job they could raise a family on. And that made it easy for people to launch their families quickly and, and get adulthood rolling. Since that time, there's been a relatively steady progression where more education is needed um, and uh, more steps up the job ladder are needed before a, a good paying job. So the economic forces um, that we see now are kind of a culmination or exacerbation of what's been going on quite a while. Mm -hmm. And apart from the economy, what else is uh, playing a role in this? Um, well, there's a couple things. Technology is certainly has a major role. So if you take a look right now, um, not even predating cell phones, long distance got cheaper. Travel, as much as it's a real hassle um, to be through an airport, you compare that to 40 years ago, and it's a lot cheaper and there's mm -hmm. more options and so still compared again you know if you were take your references 1950 we've got technology we've got cheaper long distance cheaper it's, it's basically negligible to be in touch with anybody anywhere in the world and so to that extent you know when when young people aren't in proximity to their parents they're still in proximity to their parents <laughs> you know it's just right. constant and it's instantaneous and um, so that's a big difference in terms of the shift of, of the ability to stay connected to family and um, one of the things we discussed today at the symposium is it may be a good thing. I mean, if you can count on people your whole life, um, you know, hey, you know, this might be really a good thing and not a not a bad thing. It, and it may not be a, it may not just be a transition. It may be a new way of relating that people are going to stay more intensely connected with parents and siblings because they can and because it's for a lot of people desirable and fun. You know, when I was in college, admittedly, many years ago. <laughs> the idea of calling home to my parents a long distance call it would have to be an emergency before right. it would be justified mm -hmm. to make a call like that exactly. now i survey our students at penn state uh, after a couple of days here i do always like to do an informal survey maybe asking 50 students how many times in the first 48 hours have you been in touch with your parents and it could be anywhere from two or three to as many as 10 or 12 times mm -hmm. already. So uh, there's a lot of contact. And then I asked them uh, how many of those calls were initiated by the parents. And it's about 50-50 with, with a lot of kids. So right. it leads me to ask about the flip side of this. Not the young people staying in contact with their parents or being dependent on them, but the parents not wanting to let loose. That's actually what I, where my research has been going recently, mm -hmm. and we've been looking at this. And um, I, I think it's much more complicated than that because the world is very complicated. And so the kinds of decisions that young people have to make and the amount of experience they need to land economically secure, and even finding a partner, it's just not straightforward. So the amount of sort of support and help they need is much greater than it was, you know, a few decades ago. And the fact that the parents are so involved, um, from their perspective, you know, I, I think it is mutual, but I don't think it's that they're just holding on. I think it's that they have some, maybe some wisdom, maybe some knowledge, maybe some, you know, degree, and, and it's reciprocated. It's not that the kid's going, oh, can you believe my mom keeps calling? It's, yeah, and then I called her back and I told her what, you know, so it's, it's also mutually enjoyable. And in our data, um, for the most part, the contact is good for both parties. And so when two people are benefiting, they look like they're satisfied with it. It's hard for us to say, well, hey, no, that's no good. It, it, it seems like it's, it's mutually good for them. The cases where, where we see a situation where the parent may be intervening um, in response to kids' problems, which we see is kind of one of the big scenarios where we see a lot of intense support. A kid will have anything from a health problem, victim of a crime, committed a crime, whatever it is, um, not necessarily in a university setting, the parents are very, very involved. And there we're finding some indication that it's because the parent is upset and is worried and is disappointed and is, and maybe then the parent's getting involved to make themselves feel better because it's distressful to feel, you know, upset about your kid. But for the most part, I think the context's pretty beneficial mutually. Mm -hmm. An another part of the context of this that it's hard to get perspective on is just how much kids are in touch with each other as well. Um, for instance, a statistic that came out today at the, at the conference was the median number of text messages 
used by um, college age students with phones is 50 per day. <laughs> well, <laughs> with that kind of intensity of contact going on with the world, yeah. um, maybe that the level of contact with parents is not so exceptional. Two or three contacts with the parents seems kind of negligible in that yeah, context, yeah. Yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, it's four percent. You know, it's you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're just joining us, let me tell you who we are. I'm Graham Spanier, president of Penn State, and this is, to the best of my knowledge, on WPSU, Penn State Public Broadcasting. Our topic tonight is the changing transition from adolescence to adulthood. With guests, Dr. Wayne Osgood, professor in Penn State's Department of Sociology and Crime Law and Justice, and Dr. Karen Fingerman, the Berner Hanley Professor in Gerontology, Developmental and Family Studies at Purdue University. You can join the conversation. Call us at 1-800-543-8242, or you can email us at response at psu.edu. I have my computer right here, and we'd be happy to take any of your questions by phone uh, or by computer. So let, let me ask you, uh, uh, Dr. Fingerman, when we talk about parental support, what kind of support does that take? What are the different ways in which today's parents are connecting with their uh, young people who are in this transition from adolescence to adulthood? Well, money is a big one. I mean, that is, um, and that's the one that's probably the most sort of memorable and that people really are, are focusing on. Um, the statistic seems to be around as much as 10% of their income um, parents are expending on kids 18 to 24. So hmm. that is a big one, but that's not the only kind of help. I mean, that's, um, you know, that might go back even for well-educated people, you know, 30 years ago, maybe their parents were helping with college. But there's a lot of other things going on with regard to advice and practical help and um, emotional support and even just listening to them talk about their day. So if you were married at age 22, you might talk with your spouse, but if you're not, well, you might talk with your parents. Your mom might want to know what you've been up to and be genuinely interested. And, um, and so there's just a lot of different forms of support that are going on. And again, I think if you asked your students, they a lot of them are still taking laundry home or going home for a special <laughs> meal or, um, or we just saw health insurance. You know, that's a really important form of support um, that has been extended now into young adulthood. So, with the new government policies, that yeah. can go up to age 26 for right. college students, right? Yeah, and that also means that they're going to be asking um, for medical advice. So, hey, mom, who's on our plan, and how can I find someone? Or, hey, dad, you know, what do I do with this or that copay? So there's going to there's a lot of opportunity for parents to guide young people mm -hmm. today in a lot of different ways. In the past, uh, Wayne, this transition to adulthood was pretty conventional. You graduated right. from high school. There was an order to things. A, a real serious order, and then you went to college or you went into the workforce and you got married, right. you had a child, the parents became grandparents. It, it, it was a, a, a very linear kind of trajectory, and right. now it can be all mixed up. The college Absolutely. can come later or That's not right. at all. The work can come later mm -hmm. or not at all. The children could be anywhere uh, along the way, where you're living, moving in and out. Right. Uh, how do you make sense of it all? Um, I think that the orderliness really depended on being able to pull the pull, whole package off pretty fast. And it's just not feasible for that many people um, to do so. Um, with large numbers of the population getting full college educations and professional degrees after that, or just um, unable to find full-time jobs, uh, for quite a while. I mean, we really do expect people, um, and people expect for themselves, when they get married, they can support themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of delay is about that. So when did this road to adulthood start to get longer? Oh, I think we've been hearing about it since Gen X for about 20 years. And if mm -hmm. you look, actually, um, again, if you try to look at data, it, it's been kind of linear, the shift. So as much as the 2007, we see a bigger upturn in, in the return to home or the bigger upturn in unemployment, it's, it's been kind of steady, the shifts in the way that people have been thinking about it for some time. And, um, you know, and again, that's around the time that long distance prices began to go down and then the cell phone came in. So there's a, a lot of different changes in society that have, have come along with that. Mm -hmm. And what about cohabitation? How does that factor into this? Uh, well, it's a big part of it. That's one of the biggest demographic changes that there is, 
there's been in the last half century. Or and certainly that has to that. factor into right. the average age at first marriage for men now approaching 28 and for women about 26. Right. That is, I mean, to a demographer, that is such a huge difference from in the 50s, when yeah. 1950s when the ages were about 22 and, and 20. Uh, it's dramatic. And how does that get mixed in to prolonging the the, the period? Does it, it make people feel like adolescents longer or is it just simply putting off marriage per se longer? I, 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 I suspect that it's um, sort of a combination of those things. And I, I don't know that young people feel like adolescents anymore. Mm -hmm. I think it right. is to that extent that it, it mm -hmm. deserves the new label. Because I think when I talk to young people, they really see that period as different. I'm so much older now, I get along so much better with my parents, and I am moving in a, you know, I'm, I'm exploring options as an adult. I'm not just th thinking about exploring options, I'm actually exploring options, if that makes any sense. But, you know, sort of thinking about whatever happened after high school, they either went, a lot of, a lot of Americans go on to some kind of education. Uh, the vast majority will go into something, whether it's a two year or four year or something, and begin to explore that. Um, for the ones who don't, they may or may not be able to find a job, but they're not thinking of themselves anymore the way they did in high school. And so there's something new going on. And some of that too, with regard to the partnership, some of it's cohabitation. Some, for some people, it's a series of different partners. And they haven't even hit that sort of cohabitation serious, you know, sort of this is the person I want to live with. And so th it's, it is, for some people, it's more of a, of a period of, of vicissitudes until things begin to feel a little more permanent. One thing we should keep in mind about this is that People believe strongly in marriage. The the kind of you know questionnaire um, responses to how important is it to find a good spouse to be married. Um, people are ans al that almost unanimous support for that from high school se seniors who've been asked the same question every year since 1976. Mm -hmm. But they all, th but there's a huge increase in. Do you think it's okay to live with someone before marriage? Um, and it just goes with the notion there's going to be this big gap between being old enough to be relatively on your own and the, and the time that you will have your ducks in a row yeah. so that you can establish a marriage and um, support yourself. Well, we've covered a, a good amount of ground to get started. Now we're going to open up the phone lines and take uh, a call from Andrea, who's calling from Belfont. Good evening, Andrea. You're on the air. Hi, good evening. I just had a question about... Um, this new trend might affect work ethic in young adults? For example, if they're feeling a little bit more dependent on their parents, would they be less likely to give a really tough job, you know, a good shot before kind of maybe quitting and pursuing another another job? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, on the yeah, well, stay on the line with us because we might want to come back to you, but uh, let's uh, see what our thoughts are on, on that question. Well, that, that's an interesting question. Um, I would kind of guess it would run the opposite direction. I'm not sure anybody really knows. But um, good paying long term jobs are harder and harder to find. Um, the, the people in their 20s face a lot of um, temporary jobs. Uh, even in professional, with professional training, you may be hired for a temporary consulting kind of arrangement for a year or so. So um, if if young people are presented with jobs that have the prospects to turn into a long-term arrangement, I think they have considerably more motivation to give it everything they've got. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Well, uh, she asked, in terms of the parents um, helping out, um, for kids who are successful, um, we find that parents help them a lot, and they get a lot out of helping them, and the kids get a lot out of it. And it seems like it, it in fact, does, as, as um, Wayne was saying, that, that these kids are going to be even more likely to work hard because they also want to please their parents in response to what they've received from them. Great. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for it was your, a great question. Thank you for your call, Andrea. Let's now take a call from Dick, who is calling from Johnstown. Good evening, Dick. Good evening, Dr. Spanier. I was curious if the panel yourself could look out five or ten years into the future, perhaps a little further, with the advent of online education. For instance, my son got an online master's degree from your university, Dr. Spanier, recently, uh -huh. but he was already out of our home. Yeah. And I was curious as to what effect this might have on students staying with their parents longer, 
studying on school uh, online rather than the bricks and mortar approach that is pretty much the way it is now. Do you see into the future a change? And maybe uh, uh, Karen could answer this, that she's really into the family and developmental yeah. thing. Be uh, before we ask Karen about that, let me just ask you, when your son did this online degree, was he living at home? No, he graduated uh, from Pitt and uh, was in the workplace, but was able to gather his degree. But what made me call was a curiosity if he had been at home. Yeah. Well, certainly we are seeing a tremendous increase in our online enrollment. So it's an interesting question. Dr. Fingerman? Um, in terms of where the children are going to live while they do this, um, I, I also find that an interesting thought. And I, I think you're right that, that more of them may decide to remain in the parental home for economic reasons. It makes a lot of economic sense. And if you look at what's going on around the world, in the countries that have the highest rates of kids living at home with their parents, there are definitely economic incentives. So the housing is hard to find, uh, mortgages are hard to come by, good jobs are hard to come by in Spain and Italy. And so you see very, very high rates of young people living with their parents. In the Scandinavian countries, we see a tremendous outflux at age 18, but the government helps support 18-year-olds who are going to school. They have a huge number of apartments there that are are fully supported as well. If you look at the United States, um, we're somewhat in between those two models, but certainly for uh, a kid who's taking an online degree, they're somewhat more in the Spain and Italy mode, particularly if their parents are supportive of it. So I could easily see happening what you're suggesting. Well, Dick, thank you for, for that call. And uh, one of the things that I might add in, in a comment to, uh, to Dick, uh, is that at a university like Penn State, we think of this as being a residential university with traditional college-age students from mm -hmm. 18 to 22. And that is probably the majority of our students. But if you take all of our 24 campuses together, Absolutely. we have thousands of students who are living at home, whether they're in the traditional college age or not, and commuting uh, to one of our campuses for their their education and the growing trend among those students is uh, this hybrid learning where they're taking some of their courses in residence and some of the courses online while they're at home so there may be something very interesting in there as a part of that discussion let's turn now to Marion who's calling from Somerset hello Marion you're on the air hi thanks for taking my call I just wanted to comment on the different dynamic uh, between the young people of today versus, well, I, I wouldn't say versus a young people from before, as much as the children that had to work as young children, I've noticed in my family, in my immediate family, I have slews of ne ne nieces and nephews. And the kids whose parents didn't have a lot of money, so they had to work every summer, and they worked their way through college, actually. and had to buy their own car and now those two children I'm thinking of individually have had the most success of anybody in the family because they had the work thing going for them from the get-go they didn't feel like they were too good to take a job my, my niece graduated from Ithaca College which is a private college very expensive college she's paying it for herself you know paying for it by herself she's hugely in debt right now but she worked as a waitress until she got a job in a te for a technology company for which part of her major applied to, and that's not even what she wants to do, but she's getting closer and closer to what she wants to really do, but she's keeping the waitress job because it's cash flow and she sees how it pays bills. So I'm just wondering if it's the kids that have it the hardest, I think, actually come out on the other end with a more rewarding kind of situation for themselves, even though it doesn't seem like it, because at the time they're working all summer, everybody else is out playing, and they have a job, you know, eight hours all summer mm -hmm. long. At the same time, it works for them at the end. So you're, you're really wondering, asking about whether the work ethic that people have is related to their circumstances I think of, of being, being thrown in, into it. Do you have some parents, thoughts about that? I think that? are too... I think they're too easy with their kids. I don't think they expect as much from their kids. Yeah. And let, that, let, let's, see, let's see what our, what our guests think. Well, um, I think you have a lot of good points there. And um, you know, a lot of what we're talking about is the image of the sort of failure to launch kids. Geez, after all these years and investment in college and so on, here they are 
back in their childhood bedroom and they don't seem to be doing anything productive. Um, and, you know, I, I, th I think the question is, is that person there just because they don't want to do anything else? Or are they there because they're having trouble finding opportunities and the parents are backstocking them while maybe they're doing a uh, not very, uh, a job that doesn't pay very well while they're looking for opportunities in the industry that they tried to train in. Um, and you know, parents always have to make that judgment. Is um, what am I expecting of my children? What am I asking them to put into life um, so that they can get something good out of it? I, uh, I think back to uh, my own experience of how independent I was from the moment I left home. And I, it brings me back to this topic that I raised earlier. I, I wonder how much of this discussion, we, we tend to look at it from the standpoint of the adolescence and transition to adulthood, but how much of this is encouraged by the parents. Because while I wanted my kids to graduate from college on time mm -hmm. and get a good job, I did not want them to be launched so independently that they weren't in touch with me. I still wanted to talk to them every day and be a, be a part of their lives. And it, I, I think that's a different ethic than if we go back a generation or two, where there was almost pride in parents who could say, our kids are out the door, empty nest, now we finally got our house back and we're on our own. <laughs> I think there's a, a definition too in what it takes to be independent um, and what how much independence you want. So um, I don't think that 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 kids who receive from their parents are necessarily doomed to never be able to achieve. In fact, the opposite can be true. If uh, the parent is launching the child in a way that's supportive of that child, gaining new skills, becoming, uh, getting an education, and finding new opportunities, which I think was what Wayne was saying earlier. I also think that, that what we desire is different. So for, um, you're right, the parents do want more contact. They do wanna, it's enjoyable for the parents. When we, when we look at it, a lot of the contact they're having, they they enjoy, they're getting something out of it. It's, mm -hmm. you know, pleasant and why not? You know, <laughs> why not have good family ties if you have them? Right. Let's now turn to Bill, who's calling from Warren, Pennsylvania. Hi, Bill. Good, uh, good evening, sir. I just want to follow up on a statement made by one of your callers concerning maturity by the children working their way through school. Uh -huh. uh, I'm rapidly approaching my 86th birthday and of course, I took a second World War GI, and I got into education. And when I left, uh, when, when I left the service and went to college, I found my wife, which happened to most of us. In fact, we've been married 62 years. But what I wish to say was, I did a research, and I discovered that the Second World War GI, from the idea of maturity, that we have uh, the Second World War GI was 15 percent higher than this, you know, people just coming out of college. And I'm very much in favor of maturity and going to school. Now, I did not enter the classroom until I was 26 years old. And I, I, I did not seem to have the trouble teachers do just coming out of college and going into the, into the classroom. So I'm very much like that lady said about her children working way through school. I left school when I was high school when I was 17, and I didn't get to college until I was 22. And I, I went on to graduate school, postgraduate school, but, I, but my maturity in the military did me wonders. That's all I wish to say. Mm -hmm. Any comments from our panelists? Well, I, I would just chime in to say that um, as a professor, we love to see mature students <laughs> come <laughs> in the classroom. <laughs> yeah. um, when somebody's coming in several years older than your average person right out of high school, they usually have a lot better idea why they're there. Yeah. And they want to get the most out of the class they can, not, not have the easiest time. So. I think there was a recent study that just came out. Uh, somebody put a value on this, and it, uh, it, it came out of our, our government saying that uh, $9 billion was being expended in this country on college students who dropped out of college, and what a critical right. investment this was, uh, a, a bad investment. I, I'm not sure I agree that we should consider that money down the drain, but uh, there are a lot of people who come to college at 18 and I guess aren't ready as demonstrated mm -hmm. by the fact that uh, they decide somewhere along the way this isn't for me and I shouldn't be here. 
Now here's a different perspective on maturity. I'm going to actually read this email. It's pretty interesting. It's from uh, Bruce who says, when I went to college in the 70s, I left Switzerland with a backpack and moved to Arizona. I lived in a tent for a few weeks <laughs> while I found a job, bought a used motorcycle and moved into a group home after several paychecks. I don't know if that means a commune or, or what. I put myself through college and don't remember any undue hardships. My daughter's generation, however, seems incapable of doing something <laughs> similar. It seems to me that my child's maturity level now at 21 is much less than when I was 21. Do your guests see a trend towards a lesser maturity level overall? Hmm. Trend or not? Boy, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I commend the person who wrote in and all that they accomplished, and uh, that's a pretty brave thing to go across the country with nothing and, and establish yourself. Um, uh, one contrast is that um, our people, to, young people today may need a lot more money to launch themselves to pay for a college education. Uh, um, the difference in tuition to Penn State now as opposed to the uh, 1970 is pretty enormous. Um, but still, I, I think you have a good point that there's a lot to be gained about taking responsibility for yourself. Um, and, but I, I think we just have so little to go on to say on average is there are people more mature at one time than another? I'm, I'm not sure I know how to answer the question, I'm afraid. You know, um, some of it is, I think that um, the idea that you were accomplishing things um, without resources, the world has changed, so that that's not really as feasible as Wayne was saying. The other thing, in terms of the contact with parents, so if you take that as the definition, GAI really had severed that tie, which we were talking about earlier, the flip side of that, if you talk to Asian students, students from China, they'll tell you, well, a grown-up is someone who helps take care of their parents. And if you weren't in contact with your parents and you weren't talking to them but once a week for a few minutes, well, then you weren't taking care of your parents. So some of going back to what you were asking earlier, well, how much is this is from the parent? The parent also, when they have a conversation, is sharing something about their day. It's getting some kind of gratification from that contact. So in some ways, if you used an Asian definition, you'd say, well, the old days, you didn't even call your parents. You weren't very mature. But now they call all the time. And so, so it really just depends on what it is you value and what it is you want to call maturity. I suspect that people felt more confident of their decisions um, 20, 30 years ago than young people do today. And to the extent that we want to m take that as a marker of maturity, then I do suspect that you know, we were more mature, but our decisions were a little bit easier, and there was more confidence that, hey, I'm going to go to college, I'm going to get a job. And I'm hearing, you know, young people on campuses today saying, I'm going to college, will I get a job? It's a different world. If I could throw in one more thing on sure. that. Um, what it, it takes to succeed today may be pretty different. Um, for instance, uh, students, to, uh, young people today, and these questions are asked of high school seniors about, um, are you uncomfortable with the amount of change going on in the world today? Well, there's a heck of a lot of change going on in the world today, but students are more likely to say they're comfortable than they were 15 and 20 years ago. So, and maybe that's a kind of skill maturity that is in fact uh, is on the rise in response to the different sort of world they face. If you're just joining us, I'm Graham Spanier, president of Penn State, and this is, to the best of my knowledge, on WPSU, Penn State Public Broadcasting. Our topic tonight is the changing transition from adolescence to adulthood, with guests Wayne Osgood, professor in Penn State's Department of Sociology and Crime Law and Justice, and Karen Fingerman, the Berner Hanley Professor in Gerontology, Developmental and Family Studies at Purdue University. You can join the conversation if you'd like to get in on this discussion. Feel free to pick up the phone right now and call us at 1-800-543-8242 or email us at response at psu.edu. We have an email here from uh, Anthony from Kennett Square who's asking about the growing influence of technology and how that relates to the issue. We mentioned cell phones a little bit right. at the beginning of the program, but uh, it's, it's about more than cell phones. And uh, a lot of parents uh, are emailing and texting and exchanging um, YouTube videos with uh, their children. They're on Skype, and uh, th there seems uh, 
to be a lot more connection just because of the technology that's available out there. Ab absolutely. Um, Eva Lefkowitz, who's a professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies here at Penn State, was talking about that, that um, social networking sites, um, what role those play in what it means to be a young adult. So you can, um, y there's a lot of, if we think of it as a period of time when you're discovering an identity, your identity is very public. You have to construct an identity that everyone is seeing, that people can trace forever um, once it's up there. Um, and so there's a lot of things that are going on that make it a very different world and a very, um, you know, there's not a lot of uh, private world for you to stop and think and figure out who you are anymore. But there's a lot of people you can turn to. So the flip side of it is that whatever you, information you need is readily available um, in ways that, you know, would have taken a lot of phone calls and walking to the library and so forth uh, 25 years ago. I think it changes life in just an awful lot of ways um, that we hear from our um, students in their early 20s and late teens that they're in routine contact with their friends from high school. They look at each other's uh, Facebook pages, they text each other, and so on. That There's just a possibility for keeping up with people across different parts of your lives that wasn't, wasn't feasible at that degree uh, even 10 years ago. Um, and it's hard to know how, how that's going to shape life in the long run because nobody's lived with it in the long run yet. Are we aware of any differences in this transition to adulthood by virtue of socioeconomic status? Oh, well, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're the sociologist. Yes, the answer is okay. yes, but I'll, uh, I'll let him take it. There are huge differences. Um, that, For instance, the uh, studies of the amount that parents invest in their kids um, during their 20s, comes out with a figure of about 10% of their income. Well, that's totally dependent on your income. It's a lot more money if uh, you make 100000 or $200,000 a year than if you make twenty or $50,000 a year. Um, and the, the overall pattern of the transitions, the main transitions into adulthood, marriage, full-time jobs, and so on, uh, differ hugely with social class. Uh, people coming from backgrounds with more money, more education, um, the transition is much slower, uh, be largely because um, marriage and full-time work wait until the end of pretty lengthy ed educations. So um, it's much higher proportion of people from those backgrounds don't uh, get married until late in the 20s. Mm -hmm. Whereas people coming from a more working class sort of background um, are much more likely to be getting into full-time work and if they're lucky, the kind of work they can keep in uh, much of their lives, more in the early 20s, and uh, get married and have kids younger as well. Don is on the line calling all the way from Buffalo, New York. Good evening, Don. Good evening. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment on how uh, the changes we're seeing of, I think, in a way, stronger connections of young adults to their parents compares to uh, either maybe 100 years ago or in places that are not as industrialized as much of the rest of the world where there are three generations living under a roof and uh, people tend not to move away from the home village or the hometown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well that's a very interesting question because Absolutely. we've been focusing more, uh, you know, how is it today than a, a generation ago, but if you go back further or compare us cross-culturally, it's a different kind of discussion, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, it speaks to the idea that um, in the United States we are often comparing current trends to something maybe from the 1950s or 1960s, and the reality is that was the weird thing. That was weird. Those people were weird that just <laughs> left their parents behind and went. Because worldwide, you're absolutely right, worldwide people really value the tie to their parents, their grandparents, their children. So again, sort of a Western perspective is that the romantic tie is where everything is. And I've um, heard Dr. Spanier talk about that, that the romantic tie is at the center of all relationships. But worldwide, the tie to parent, grandparent, and the intergenerational tie is really the most important. And people live together. They, they fight longer, too. So what, whereas we say, oh, adolescence is over, now it's all home free, the kids get along pretty well. Um, you know, when you're still living under the same roof, there's more opportunity for conflict, there's more opportunity for closeness. It's a, it's a very different form of relationship. And I have wondered about that. Is it that we're now becoming more like 
the rest of the world in our ties. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the world actually values relationships more than independence. Mm -hmm. That independence has been the American thing. And I, I've wondered if, if part of what we're seeing is not just about young adults, but just in general, that we're suddenly discovering that, hey, you know what? Relationships are kind of nice. Let's, <laughs> let's encourage them, you know? Right. One, uh, one other way of thinking about what's different now than it was 50 years ago, and also different than the 100 years ago and back further, is that we now have a period after um, living with your parents when a lot of people are independent for a while. Um, and for, like, go back to the 50s and so on, that was limited to men. Uh, and, but they only moved away from home when they had full-time work, and, they might, mm -hmm. and then they would live on their own. But women rarely moved out of their family, uh, you know, from their family of origin until they got married, okay? Um, and so now we're adding more connections. It's often moving back to the family home. Um, and that's similar to long ago, but it's this kind of independent period living on your own of uncertain length that's really what's probably different than any other time. I understand that there's also some research, for example, showing that there are uh, subcultural differences today within the U.S., for example, that uh, Hispanic, young Hispanic people are much less likely to pick up roots and completely leave their families behind. And I think we do see that a little bit with some of our Absolutely. university graduates when they're looking at various employment options and uh, areas of the country that they could, could live in. I should add, in terms of the subgroups, Hispanics are also very likely to be trying to support their parents in some way, mm -hmm. so that they're, um, you know, sometimes you'll you'll have a college student who's who's sending money home, um, as opposed to the opposite. So yeah, there's definitely subgroup differences in terms of the values and the, the you know the the, deg the degree to which people are trying mm -hmm. to stay in connection. Our next caller is Bola J calling from Houtsdale. Good evening. So good evening. Uh, yes, uh, mine is a, a kind of a question and also observation. Uh, I was raised in Africa, where it appears to me that over there, parents start to give children a lot of freedom. Uh, like, I can't remember any time that I was playing soccer that my parents had to be there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, if right. it was a special <laughs> occasion, they could attend. I have seen people who came from other countries who come here and say, oh, in America, you go to school with a child. If the child is in school, you're also in school. <laughs> because there is so much involvement. Um, I went to a boarding school, a private boarding school, so did my older brother. Our parents, and many other parents, never had to follow us there. By the time we were 15, we were you know, smart enough to make you know, some very good decisions. Uh, they didn't have to follow us around, you know. Uh, and sometimes you wonder, is there something that is being compensated for? Because recently I heard that even in Denmark, you know, children five, six, seven uh, go to school not far away from the house and their parents don't have to follow them there. Mm -hmm. uh, they just take their books and, you know, walk to school and back home on their own. Well, I can, I can tell you this, that if I ever missed one of my daughter's soccer matches, I heard about it from her <laughs> because I was supposed to be there. Right. Uh, let, let me ask you a couple of questions, uh, Bola J. What country in Africa were you from? I, I was born in Ghana, but I grew up both in Ghana and in Nigeria. Okay. And, and uh, has your move to the United States changed your views of this at all? Do you, I, I don't know if you did your parenting there or here, but how did that change from a different continent to here with very different standards affect your own situation? Well, it's uh, kind of um, uh, an ongoing process for me and some of my friends uh, who are raising children. First of all, a lot of time the school is very far away from home. Uh, the child can drive, so they either go by bus, you know, where there was bus involved, we walk to the bus you know, station ourselves. We didn't have to. Our parents didn't have to follow us there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, a kind of, uh, uh, I believe that there should be more independence, you know, given to the children, uh, not treating them like they are still babies. Um, that's my observation, you know, that maybe, and sometimes I wonder, is there something that parents are compensating for? Uh, because there are things that I will see, uh, you know, like you go to the restaurant, uh, teenage boys who are and girls who are stronger than their parents will sit down there in some cases, and the parents will be the one that goes to the, you know, to the uh, 
uh, food place to get the food and bring it to them. Uh, in other cultures, you know, my, my father will tell my mother, why are you doing that? They are stronger than you. Let them do it, you know. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, some of these uh, uh, things are there that I'm, and I, I, I don't know, I'm wondering, was, was it like that, say, 50 years ago, that parents will follow kids to school and, you know, drive them to state college and, you know, go to the store and pick things for them, even though they are becoming young adults? Was it like that? Or this is a new trend where parents are trying to make up for something. Well, any any reaction to his comments? Very interesting, of course. Oh no, no, he's absolutely right. And I, I again, I've thought of that. That um, you know, if you looked at it from a purely sort of where is the peak of physical strength and cognition and so on, we are kind of squandering young adulthood by having these kids still in transition. They should be doing, you know, the most work. And um, and then you know, and then those of us who are my age should be you know just relaxing and so <laughs> forth. And you know, and even by age ten, if you look worldwide, I, I think ten-year-olds in many um, um, non-industrialized countries. Um, grow more calories than they consume. And so that's kind of another peak, that 10-year-olds sh can produce more um, in some countries than they consume. But certainly the United States would not fit in those models. And so, you know, it's, it's an interesting point as to, as to why we've got what we've got. One thing that has been striking me that, that hasn't been mentioned, because my field is gerontology, is that life expectancy in the United States has increased dramatically um, over the past 100 years. So in 1900, the average person lived to age 40. And in many African nations right now, that is still the case, is that it's 40 or even younger, life expectancy. It doesn't mean that everybody's born and dies at 40, but it means that death is more evenly distributed. So you could die at any point and not that many old people are around. In the US, we expect to live to old age. Our college students, if you ask them, they all expect to have a period of time that's either, you know, that is retirement, whether they're gonna have retirement savings or not, but they expect to live to age 80. And that gives you a very different perspective on how much you have to rush things. Mm -hmm. You can just savor it a little bit if you've got 70 more years, right? I mean, you know, and so I think that that kind of is there without anyone being explicit about it, but that's part of the whole thing. If you because um, I do this with my students is I have them do their lifeline and they all put to 80 and they, you know, they travel and they do all kinds of stuff. And then I say, now let's do it again and this time you get to live to age 35. And they, it's amazing what they do is they reconstruct the whole thing so it's all squished uh, together. Yeah. And they, um, nobody goes to graduate school, I should add, when you only have to age 35. <laughs> we have far fewer PhDs. Um, and they, and they, you know, and so it's partly, I do think, without anyone really thinking about it, unconsciously I think we know they've got a long time. They're going to, yeah. you know. Now, we're, we've been kind of making an assumption in our discussion that all kids are good and great, and it's only a matter of maturity or the length right. of the transition. But there are troubled youth out there, and there's a Absolutely. whole criminal justice system out there dealing with uh, a lot of kids these days who have personal problems, social issues, mm -hmm. commit crimes, get on the right. wrong side of the law. Uh, how does that all factor in to this uh, population and, well, uh, and to this extended transition period? Um, there are really lots of groups. I mean, some are troubled in the sense of their behavior is problematic, and so we intervene in their lives. The juvenile court judge says you're going off to the state correctional institution. Uh, some are troubled because maybe their parents are doing a particularly bad job, and so they're made wards of the state and put into foster care. Um, interesting thing about this is that we have lo lots of government programs specifically to address special needs, special problems of children. Um, and, you know, childhood has a special status. We say, if your parents aren't raising you right, if you have problems beyond the means of most families, we need a program to help you because children are important. Um, and those programs all have limits to their eligibility. They, you turn 18, you don't go in the juvenile justice system, you go to prison. Um, you turn 18 and foster care ends. And when people aren't really, don't have an easy path to full adulthood at age 18, that's pretty problematic. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, there are movements to extend um, the support of foster care beyond age 18 and solve, trying to solve problems for these groups with special needs and special difficulties because if no one else is being fully adult at age 18, um, what's gonna happen to these folks? And often they're coming from families with the least resources as well. 
you know, we have email coming in. I just want to say Bolaje has developed a f little fan club here pretty <laughs> fast <laughs> online. Uh, here's one from Bruce saying, I think we are, Bolaje has a point. I think we are smothering our children. I think it is detrimental to their development. So uh, maybe you would get Bolaje on here sometime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be great. That get everybody straightened out. <laughs> you know, one of the things that's out there right now that I, I see is uh, many parents want to be friends with their kids and and the kids maybe want to be friends with their parents it, it, when you get to be 24 or 26 or 28 uh, do things change to the point where if there is still a strong connection it can develop into a friendship and that's now um, an aspect of of the relationship Yes and no. Uh, to the extent that, so, so here's the deal is as the kid gets older, um, I've seen 21 year olds when I interview them and they say, my mom's my best friend. I call her and I tell her everything that's happened to me and she helps me solve all my problems. And if I ask them, you know, do you bring your lawn? Oh yes, she makes my favorite meals. And I think, I don't have any friends who are willing to do all that for me. That's not a <laughs> friendship. That's your mom and it's better than it was in adolescence. But yeah, you really got to count your blessings in that one. And so, um, so, so they're recognizing it with some, some nice terminology. Now, as they get to be, you were giving an older age, 26, 28, and as, as they grow, you know, even into their 30s, can it take on more of that characteristic? And I think it can, yes, it, it absolutely can, where it becomes more reciprocal and more mutual, and people recognize their parents' strengths and weaknesses and recognize them for who they are and want to do for them. But I don't think it ever really becomes a friendship because of the history of the fact that they were raised and the fact that the parent always, always gets to be the parent. They always get to be the parent. It doesn't matter what changes that is their role and so you know um, we bought our house from a man who was 80 and his um, he was moving to retirement center and his mother who was 105 decided that if it was good enough for him she was going to move there too so she moved there at the same time as him and the story was that he was out one day pushing her wheelchair and she said she sent him back in to get a jacket I mean she was still his mother you know <laughs> he was he was 80 years old he's like mother I'm 80 years old I'm in a retirement center but you know there's still a part of that sure. that's not going to go away so I don't think you ever really become friends yeah. Now we have uh, listeners and viewers who are in somewhat more urban settings, maybe mm -hmm. closer to where we are, but a lot of people in rural areas of Pennsylvania. Absolutely. Do we know about any rural urban differences in this phenomenon? Um, that's a good question. There are a few things. Um, one is that the issue of launching children is pretty different in rural areas than urban areas um, because most uh, rural areas um, actually uh, are losing population. And a lot of the way they lose it is that uh, people who are very successful, uh, the young people going off to college, getting professional degrees, there really aren't the opportunities for them back home. So there's some dynamics surrounding that that, um, that can be bittersweet to have kids that are very successful. Um, in urban areas, well, the, there's, um, I, I think most of what we're talking about probably applies pretty well um, and is mainly based on urban areas. I'm going to ask our gerontologist a question. You know, we've been talking about this extended period of years during which uh, children, adolescents, moving into adulthood are sometimes more dependent on their parents economically, maybe living back at home with them and not launching quite as quickly. What about on the other end of the spectrum now? D does that in any way translate into uh, the parents now expecting their young people to reciprocate 20, 40, 60 years later when they're in need uh, of care? Well, you know, we, we aren't going to know the answer to that one for another, yeah. you know, because of what you were just describing, well, you're the generation that now has elderly parents and you were very independent and so forth. Right. So, so we're not really going to know the answer to that. What we know right now is that, um, we do have some longitudinal data and so when that means we've seen p the same person over time and when a kid received a lot in young adulthood they often do reciprocate by providing for their parents but the path that explains that isn't directly that people keep a bank account and say well mom invested a hundred hours in me and I'll you know with interest I guess I owe her 106 back um, what's happening instead is that um, 
the, the parents invest in a lot of different kinds of kids, but the kid, one of the kids they, they invest in is a kid they get along with well who's very successful. And that kid, when we look right now, even when they're 19, 20 years old, they're not doing very much for their parents. Parents don't get much, but the little they get, they're getting from that kid. And when you look at who's providing care in old age, it's the middle-aged equivalent of that kid. It's a kid who's done well, loved their parents, and the parent has been invested in them because they were just really a, a good kid, if you will, and now they're a good kid in their 40s, and they're still there for that parent um, often in that scenario when, when parent care occurs. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we've covered a lot of ground, and I want to thank both of you, along with our many callers who called into the show and our loyal listeners. Thanks to our guest tonight, Wayne Osgood, professor in Penn State's Department of Sociology and in Crime, Law, and Justice, and Karen Fingerman, the Berner Hanley Professor in Gerontology, Developmental and Family Studies at Purdue University, who I must add, uh, started her career here at uh, Penn State. And thank you for watching. We want to remind you that tonight's program will be stored in an electronic archive that can be accessed through WPSU.org. This site also links to online resources on tonight's topic. We hope you'll join us on Tuesday, November 8th, when we talk about an everyday topic that turns out to be a monumental topic, managing and maintaining our hair. To the best of my knowledge is a production of Penn State Public Broadcasting. For all of us here at WPSU, I'm Graham Spanier. Have a good night. Presentation of To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU is made possible in part by support from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. And from the members of WPSU. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.